Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire podcast. I am Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Dave Meltzer, who uh, has worked uh, with me for a long time and uh, across many titles for both of us. But today, Dave is the CTO at Tripwire, right, Dave? That's right. Glad to join you today, Tim. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the attack surface today. But before we dig into some of the, the details, why don't we start with just a, a little bit of conversation about what we mean when we say attack surface. I think this is a, a term that inside of the, the information security bubble, we, we tend to throw around, but we don't necessarily talk about what it means that much. So Dave, from your perspective, what, what are we talking about? Here? Yeah, absolutely. That That is some inside baseball terminology. Um, the first term that you often hear people talk about is attack vectors. Uh, an attack vector really isn't much more than, you know, some avenue that someone's going to use to exploit uh, your systems, your networks, your information. Uh, and then the attack surface, uh, I think of as just the sum of all the attack vectors for your company, organization, whatever uh, span of control you're trying to protect. Now, that's an interesting way to think about it. I hadn't really thought about the relationship between attack vector and attack surface. So uh, as an example, just this morning, I was uh, uh, reading about, uh, you know, a malware outbreak. And of course, the malware is the, the headline. But in the, the details of the article, it talks about how the initial intrusion was made through, a, you know, an unpatched vulnerability. Well, and so that's an example of a, an attack vector, right? Uh, that's an attack vector. And, and isn't that the same thing that we've been seeing in security for, for, for 20 plus years now? Uh, people are not patching vulnerabilities. Um, they're not updating their systems. They're not properly configuring uh, services. Uh, what services those are or where they're coming from is changing. Uh, but some of the basic security hygiene of, of just doing the basics right, uh, we're still getting wrong in 2020. Well, the basics are so boring, Dave. That's that's why. They're boring and hard, which is a tough combination for someone to take on. Absolutely. We, we would always like to have the shiny new object that would just be the silver bullet for security if only such a thing existed. Uh, I've been told by by a number of uh, startups at various times that they, they have that. So I'm sure it's coming soon. Yes, over 1,600 cybersecurity companies are out there now. Uh, and uh, probably at least 1,500 of them will say uh, they have the silver bullets for security. So if we go back to the attack surface for a second, I, I mean, I think we talked a little bit about what, what we mean by attack surface. It's, it's a pretty broad term, and it's something that, that doesn't stay the same and isn't the same for every organization, right? Different organizations have different uh, different attack surfaces, really. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the more modern attack surfaces we're seeing have to do with the changing IT infrastructure. So as people are rolling out new environments, new systems, whether that be cloud, IoT, uh, those are all creating new attack vectors that traditional solutions that we may have had may, may not be covering. Uh, and we may need to look at, you know, how do we extend coverage into those systems to prevent those kind of attacks? Well, so let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, we're just, uh, you know, not too far after the end of, of 2019 at this point. And what did we really see change in terms of attack surface in 2019? What, what jumps out at you, Dave, as changes that we saw in, in the last year? Yeah, well, you know, I kind of think of it in two different dimensions here. One is, you know, the last year. Uh, and I think we saw some, some incremental, um, growth in terms of the size, scale, and complexity of attacks. Uh, and the scale of attack is something that just continues to grow over time. Uh, just to give you a couple examples here, um, you know, we're looking at, when we think about attack surface, there's over 200,000 different vulnerabilities that someone may exploit across all the different systems today. Uh, you compare that back to when I started in cybersecurity back in the mid nineties, uh, we had a vulnerability scanner I was working on that had about 150 vulnerabilities. So over, over a hundred, X magnitude of increase in scale is what we're now seeing today. 
Um, at the same time, the number of breaches and the scale of these breaches are also orders of magnitude. Uh, in 2019, we saw the first American breach. That was 885 million records from a real estate agent. Uh, in total, over 8 billion records were stolen in 2019. Um, you know, people are starting to get this fatigue of how many times can my same information be stolen over and over? Um, but the scale of these attacks are just continuing to increase over time. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost unfathomable to think about that that number of records and what it might mean to to you as an individual. Yeah, and it's uh you know it's all over the globe, um, and some of this is the proliferation of cloud is now concentrating some of these massive amounts of records online that with a one simple cloud configuration error is exposing potentially a hundred million records like Capital One. 275 million records like we saw from a MongoDB exposure. Um, the Orvibo breach, which was over 2 billion records from a smart home system. Just a huge proliferation of these hundreds of millions, billion records uh, thefts, which is just totally different from what we saw a number of years ago, where these were just much more smaller scale. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And you pointed out something, I mean, you didn't intend to point it out necessarily, but uh, that that jumped out at me in terms of of what we saw change in 2019. You were talking about the 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 increase in the number of vulnerabilities that are out there, um, and that 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 tell, reminds me that the attack surface for a particular organization can change even though nothing has changed for that organization. Right, the threat environment shifts, and that means your attack surface changes as well. Yeah, at, at Tripwire, one of the phrases we often use is you know all security issues either start with a, a change or a need for a change. Uh, and, and that is, you know, as the threat environment changes, as new vulnerabilities are discovered, uh, but also as the external environment changes, uh, something, you know, you may need to go do something and take action. So sitting still in security is not giving you a status quo. Sitting still is moving you backwards on a daily basis. You're listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes a breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. Learn more at tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. Uh, so the vulnerability example is one example, but when I think about how adoption of particular technologies changes the threat environment, that's another perspective to consider. So if I'm, for example, if I've uh, you know adopted a particular cloud technology, let's say you know cloud storage, uh, Amazon S3, and I'm an early adopter. There's much less attention being paid to how to exploit that technology by the attackers because there's a relatively small uh, target surface for them. But as more organizations adopt that technology, we see the attackers themselves increase their level of attention that they're paying to how to exploit that type of technology. And so my my attack surface changes in terms of its its relative importance or its nature based on the technology that others adopt as well. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting idea that you bring up, which is, you know, when we first saw adoption of cloud services, a lot of it came with this concept of shadow IT, which is the the reason some of the development community was moving to cloud was it it actually because it avoided some of the IT process controls that were in place and let people operate with more flexibility and freedom than some of their traditional on-premise data centers that had built up a lot of levels of IT control, including security. So when you took that away, people could move more quickly. Um, but you're right. They probably weren't getting attacked very heavily early on because people just weren't recognizing it. it there wasn't that big of an attack surface. Uh, today, um, you know, cloud is one of the biggest attack surfaces we see. Those exposed storage buckets that you talked about, that's the most common exposure uh, for cloud services uh, that we're seeing in 2019. At, at least it's the most common publicly available exposure that, that we hear about. And I'd love to say that that's a change in 2019, that, that the S3, uh, you know, publicly available S3 buckets is something new, but it, it started before 2019. It just didn't, it didn't seem to get any better last year either. Uh, yeah, in, you know, in, in my, uh, going around the world talking to a lot of, uh, chief information security officers, I'm clearly seeing a lot more attention being paid to cloud security, 
uh, now than two or three years ago. Uh, but many organizations are still in a very early maturity stage in terms of their adoption of cloud. So whereas some of the, like the financial services companies uh, that we work with at Tripwire, um, they've done a lot of investment into cloud security today. Uh, there are other companies that might be in areas like manufacturing or retail or healthcare, uh, where they're starting to dip their toe in cloud. Uh, and they may still be in this kind of early stage where financial services were three, four years ago, uh, where they're starting to move applications to the cloud, but don't have that same security stack technology and expertise that they've built up over time. Yeah. Yeah. Adoption of the technologies is certainly not, not consistent across industries. And that, that creates a, you know, a disparity in terms of, of understanding of that attack surface as well. Absolutely. So you, you, you mentioned manufacturing in there. That's another area I think that we saw significant change in, in the last year, which is the, the growing awareness, at least, of the, the vulnerable attack surface on the, the industrial side, manufacturing being an example of that. But I think, I think utilities are probably the bigger, uh, you know, example that we saw in the press, at least. Yeah. Well, so let me, let me give you a trivia question, Tim. Um, what percent of manufacturing companies do you think experienced a shutdown or data loss uh, over the last year? Ooh, what percent? I assume you have a real answer to provide uh, when I give my wrong answer. From from the Ponemon Institute. So this is a legitimate security source. Okay. All right. Uh, so experienced a shutdown. What, tell me the question again so I make sure I understand what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm answering. Manufacturing companies that experienced a shutdown uh, of manufacturing or data loss in the last 12 months. Uh, not, n there's no particular vector or, or cause there. Nope. It's where this is any, any sort of attack uh, Ooh, that led then, to uh, shut down or data loss. Uh, then I'll probably aim a little bit higher. I'll say 30% seems high. I'm going to go with 25%. Well, this number actually surprised me when I read this study as well. It was actually 56%. Oh my gosh. Um, so manufacturing companies who traditionally have been, you know, more conservative about ov overall IT investment. So it's not just security that they're not spending as much of as a bank, but it's just anything in IT. Um, but that doesn't mean the attacks aren't coming at the same rate. Uh, and in some ways, you think the attackers as they're going after the softest targets, you know, why not just go after the easiest place you can get in? Uh, and in this case, you know, that is areas like manufacturing and healthcare today, uh, the soft targets generally are not the large banks anymore. Well, so let, let, let me just go back to that statistic for a second, because I think what you just said there is that the majority of manufacturers experienced a shutdown due to a, an attack in 2019. Uh, a, a shutdown or data loss. Uh, and a those shutdown shutdowns are, are particularly prevalent because as these attacks make their way into the, the OT or the industrial environments, um, they're much more frequently hitting systems that maybe there's not, you know, a million records that you want to go steal from a, a programmable logic controller or a robot line in a manufacturing plant. Uh, but those are systems that often are brittle and are very easy once you're inside to just take down with some denial of service. Uh, and for manufacturing, the cost of downtime can be extraordinarily high. Yeah. I mean, it's a big deal. Obviously, if you, if you stop manufacturing the thing that, that, that makes you money, um, you, you kind of stop making money. Absolutely. Mission, mission critical to the business, keeping those manufacturing lines going. Uh, and security, uh, you know, is turning into manufacturing. You know, one, uh, people are concerned about safety, um, because as we cross this cyber physical plane, um, you know, you're talking about physical things that humans are close to and, you know, people are worried about that safety issue. Uh, but the bigger thing is just availability. Um, you know, we think about integrity when it comes to data security most frequently, but we got to think about safety and availability when we think about industrial security first. Yeah, it's a, it's a mindset shift for, you know, if you're, if you've been involved in, in IT information security for a long time, shifting your mindset to focus on availability and safety can be a, a challenging thing to do. Yep, absolutely. So, um, were there any big surprises for you in terms of the attack surface in 2019? You know, what was the surprise? You know, I, Having been in security for over 20 years now, you know, we saw a lot of incremental, um, you know, continued breaches. Um, so if anything surprises me, it, it's almost that 20 years later, the problem is worse than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. Um, at least in my, in my career. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to think of that as a personal failure, but I think of it as an industry, 
um, that we need to continue to do better. Uh, we need to continue to remove the human element and how much time and effort and complexity is involved in security and just make it simpler for organizations. Uh, if there's one thing that I've kind of learned and taken away from, from my experience, it's, uh, you know, the, the problems, the vulnerabilities, the attacks happen where, uh, things are just too complex and people just can't keep all of the things they need to do that whole stack of security straight. Yeah. Complexity is definitely a, a, you know, sort of a root cause, um, for, for security or insecurity if the case, as the case may be. I think, you know, for me, one of the surprises was that the, the S3 bucket challenge, publicly available S3 buckets continued to be a problem. Um, I'm, I'm, I have sort of a morbid fascination with that particular, uh, type of exposure because it's, it's one of these things that's so, relatively easy to address there are tools in the market that help you identify that amazon has made changes to help you identify it yet in 2019 we continued to see organizations suffer uh you know breaches based on publicly available s3 buckets that was a surprise for me yeah and you know one of the one of the sayings that uh that that makes me think of is you know when it comes to attacking uh you have to defend 24 hours a day seven days a week every single area of potential attack vector uh, the attackers just have to find one way in one second of the day, uh, you know, one day of the year. And when you think about cloud, because there's such continuous monitoring of the attack surface uh, by the attackers, uh, you just have very little time window and just a very small window of making any sort of mistake before it's just going to get exploited and you're going to be breached. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds pessimistic. So uh, maybe we can be a little more optimistic. I don't know. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about what we, we expect in 2020 in terms of attack surface. Where do you, what do you think is going to change in the coming year, um, even though we've already started it, but uh, for, in terms of attack surface? Well, you know, one thing that I'm, I'm starting to track very closely is um, cyber warfare. Uh, you know, we already saw from the Iran attacks that a, a 300% increase in the number of attacks coming from Iran uh, from cyber. Uh, and that's an area that could continue to ramp up uh, across the world. Uh, and that makes me particularly concerned about this cyber physical plane. Uh, and will cyber start to become a much more prevalent uh, area than it's been in the past? Certainly we've seen that uh, happen, but maybe just not at the intensity uh, that I'm worried about it this year. Uh, the other thing that we're continuing to see growth of is ransomware. Ransomware is just continuing to push as a primary, maybe not way into an organization. That's not what ransomware is but a primary way of monetizing the exploitation that's happening. Yeah, ransomware is an interesting interesting topic because, of course, it, in order for it to be effective, in order for the ransom to get paid, it, it has to announce itself. So in terms of visibility, ransomware is always going to sort of shoot to the top of the list because, you know, ransomware that, that nobody knows about uh, doesn't ever ever get the ransom paid. So I, my concern there is that it's, it's masking more serious... Uh, you know, compromises and exploit activity that, that is aimed at being stealthy. So if, if we're all worried about ransomware and we stop paying attention to detecting other types of attacks or, or lower the amount of attention we're paying, then we're going to find that, that, uh, you know, those other types of compromises increase and we don't know it. And that, that ties to that nation state piece, right? You know, if Iran is launching cyber attacks, they might want them noticed if they're, if they're aimed at, at wiping data or causing a, you know, physical damage, but they're going to remain stealthy as long as they can in order to carry it out. Absolutely. Hmm. So in terms of how organizations should prepare for the coming year, I think I think ransomware is a good place to start. It, whether we like it or not, it's a reality. Um, do you think organizations should do anything different in 2020 in terms of ransomware preparation? Well, you know, I think the, the couple of things to think about, you know, in terms of your 2020 security programs would be, you know, one, what's my security framework? Um, you know, we've seen a lot of adoption of the NIST cybersecurity framework. So whether you're using NIST, whether you're using ISO, uh, if you're a healthcare company and you're adopting high trust, uh, understand that framework and how are you going to iterate uh, and continuously improve in security in 2020. So focus on the framework, focus on uh, what's the maturity of your different areas of security programs uh, and do the basics well. Uh, if you do those three things, uh, you'll probably have a good uh, a good process for improvement in 2020, uh, and you'll best position yourself to reduce your chances of of being breached. I think on on ransomware, my my two cents is really about prevention. I mean, obviously, preventing ransomware is the preferred uh, preferred method of dealing with it, and you have to deal with response. 
But if you can prevent that ransomware from getting a foothold, from getting into your environment in the first place, then you're far better off and you don't have to deal with, with whether or not to pay it and how to respond to it. Um, which goes back maybe to that, that security framework conversation that, 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 uh, comment that you were just making. Um, identify those, uh, attack vectors, um, you know, get a good handle on your attack surface and that'll help with the, the, the prevention of ransomware. Se- security, like most things in life. Uh, the prevention is cheaper uh, than trying to address the uh, the problem once it's already occurred. So ab- absolutely, uh, focusing on prevention is the right uh, the right answer. Of course, yeah, incident response breaches will happen. You won't prevent all of all of those issues, so you do need to focus on that as well. But uh, yeah, doing those basics right, just patching your vulnerabilities. Um, you know, we could have said that in 1996. Uh, we say I think, 2020 I think we as well. <laughs> yep. And then on this nation state piece, uh, you know, this is one where I think there's a lot of press and a lot of hype. Does every organization need to worry about cyber attacks from Iran or cyber attacks from China? Well, in, in some respects, yes, because some of these malware pieces will start to just proliferate across different systems and will not be specifically targeted to a spe- to specific organization. Uh, at the same time, critical infrastructure is going to be the most subject to cyber attacks because that's going to have the biggest impact uh, on our nation. And so if you're in a critical infrastructure industry, uh, then you have to be, pay particular attention. And, and that's areas like, um, like, you know, utility companies, um, organizations that are manufacturing critical systems, even, even areas like our food and beverage manufacturing systems, which we haven't paid a whole lot of attention to, but imagine a cyber attack that actually impacted the the physical manufacturing or adjusted uh, something in how things are being built. That would that would be an attack that would really be uh, a very different kind of attack than we've seen in the past, uh, and something that you know from a longer term perspective, you know, we do have to worry about: are they are they going to do the same old thing? Are they going to just you know send malware and try and take down systems, or, or are they actually going to try and you know actually impact our, our nation in some meaningful way? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, transportation you could include in there, and I always. I always include finance in terms of critical infrastructure because if you can do significant uh, damage to our, our financial infrastructure, it has a real impact on on any any country. Yep. All right. Well, Dave, uh, thanks for spending the time with us. I think it was an interesting conversation, um, one that we might have had anyway, but we got a chance to record it for, for others to enjoy. So uh, thanks for spending the time with us. And uh, to everyone who's listening, thank you for listening. Um, and uh, we hope you uh, tune in again. Thanks, Tim. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.